And welcome to a, depending on your perspective, either uncharacteristically beautiful or crushingly psychedelic episode of the Oddity Archive. So today, I'd like to do the much belated companion piece to an episode I did a couple years ago on those early stabs at putting sound on film. Today, I want to take a look at some of those early cracks at color film, but not Technicolor. Uh, maybe some other time. But uh, anyway, I really like these episodes because it's one of those all-too-rare occasions where I get to pretend to be a film historian. And I find myself mispronouncing a lot of French words along the way. Prior to the uh, development of motion picture film, Color was, of course, very much the norm in media. For example, paintings and magic lanterns, and pretty much anything a magic lantern could run. There'd also been stabs at color still photography since the early 1860s, if not farther back. Thing was, as of the rise of motion picture film in the 1890s, no process was conducive to the rapid-fire nature of shooting a movie. As such, one could view black and white movies as a step backwards. Today's episode deals with the most significant stabs at reintroducing color. The first stab at color on film is also far and away the most obvious, simply drawing it on by hand. And it would make sense, the projector itself doesn't know if it's in color or not. Anyway, the earliest known hand-colored film was the Annabelle Serpentine Dance, which kinda deserves its own segment. The first color movie is usually considered to be the Annabelle Serpentine Dance, starring future Ziegfeld Follies Gibson girl Annabelle Moore. This film was made by the Edison Company for use in their kinetoscope machines. There are at least five versions of this film, made from 1894 to 1897, partly because it was so popular that Edison could no longer successfully strike new prints of it, and partly because competitors, such as American Mutoscope, wanted their own versions. The first version was made in August of 1894, and is lost. However, Annabelle's Butterfly Dance, presumably from the same session, survives. The most famous version of the Annabelle Serpentine Dance is the third one, made during the summer of 1895. This particular dance is no accident. Louis Fuller rose to fame in Paris a few years earlier by creating not only the dance, but a, for the time, elaborate light show to give the illusion of her dress seemingly magically changing colors. The first several years' worth of hand-colored films were done 100% freehand, sometimes having to use a single-haired brush to color the films, using mostly dyes and a few paints. Oh yeah, and there were no duplication methods either. As such, each frame of each copy of each film is unique. Having said that, some films were better done than others. The weaker ones are pretty much just a blob of color in and around the general vicinity of each pertinent item.
Here in the States, hand-colored films wound up being very rarely pursued, partially because it doubled the cost of individual prints, and partially because most films made in the U.S. at the time just wouldn't have benefited from it. However, over in France, the Lumiere brothers, and especially Georges Méliès, were churning out some truly trippy trick films, which were far more conducive to color. The majority of these films were colored at the studio of mother-daughter team Elizabeth and Bertha Thulier. At their peak, the Thuliers employed some 220 women to churn the films out almost assembly line style. Looking to streamline the process of coloring films, in 1903, Pathé, then the world's largest film company, set out to develop a stencil-based system, which was unveiled in 1905. The process was known as Pathé Color, not to be confused with a much later system of the exact same name. Anyway, these stencils were created using a specially made reducing pantograph. Each stencil would correspond to a single color out of a single frame of film. While this initial process was incredibly slow and painstaking, once complete, the appropriate dyes could be applied quickly to a print of the film, one color at a time, with near-identical results each time. Amazingly, while the original Pathé color method never got too popular, it had quite a run, occasionally popping up at least as late as 1930. The first natural color film process was the Lee Turner process, named after financier and professional cricket player Frederick Marshall Lee, and inventor Edward Raymond Turner. Patented in 1899 and tested in 1901 and 1902, the Lee-Turner process attempted to cull color from the three additive primary colors, red, green, and blue, RGB. This system shot three copies of the same image, one apiece through red, green, and blue filters. Problem was, for playback, a special three-lens projector was needed, which was near impossible to focus. Coupled with the fact that the film itself needed to be shot with absolute precision, and ideally no fast-paced motion on the final film, and the need for his special home-punched 38mm film, it was a dud. This system never got past the experimental stages. Lee sold out his interest in the process to filmmaker Charles Urban in September of 1902. Turner died of a heart attack in March of 1903 at the age of 29, having never seen a successful playback of his work. Urban donated the footage to the London Science Museum in 1937, where the footage laid in storage until 2012. That year, the British National Science and Media Museum transferred and restored the film, then digitally rebuilt the color, and discovered the hard way that, contrary to popular belief, the film only ran at 16 frames per second, as opposed to 48 frames, you know, 16 times 3. Anyway, jumping back to 1903, shortly after Edward Raymond Turner's death, Charles Urban turned the Lee Turner project over to inventor, among other things, George Albert Smith. Which leads us to... The first successful stab at natural color on film was really a much simplified version of the Lee-Turner process. 
The aforementioned George Albert Smith found very early on that three colors just complicated things. So Smith dropped the blue filter completely, reverted back to 35 millimeter film, and altered playback so that the film would now be run through a mechanically rotating wheel with two concurrent red filters and two concurrent green filters separated by two empty slots. Patented in 1906 and introduced in 1908, Kinema Color never did quite iron out the color errors from the Lee Turner system. Motion in shots still cause serious color tearing, especially if the subject is moving at a decent rate. Despite its problems, Kinema Color kind of sort of caught on. Around 200 commercially released films were made using this process. However, Kinema Color was curtailed in 1914 when fellow British inventor William Freeze Green sued George Albert Smith and Charles Urban for patent infringement. Freeze Green had his own ultra similar additive two color process called BioColor. Given that Freeze Green patented and demoed his system first, the courts sided with Freeze Green. In the end, Smith and Urban lost control over Kinemacolor. Freeze Green's existing financial woes, coupled with World War I, kept Biocolor from ever getting beyond a few private experimental films. The most noteworthy crack at three-color additive color was Galmont Chronochrome. Publicly introduced by the Gaumont Company in 1913, Chronochrome was easily the most complicated additive system. Admittedly, I'm seriously dumbing this down, but here's the basics. Unlike previous stabs at additive color, Chronochrome involved three copies of the same image, each shot with a violet, green, or orange filter, shot simultaneously on a proprietary camera. Playback required a proprietary projector, which was fitted with a series of lenses and mirrors that, when aligned properly, gave full color. In the name of cutting costs and saving wear and tear on the film, the frame height of the film itself was reduced by one quarter, inadvertently inventing widescreen in the bargain. However, the system had its drawbacks. First off, the filtering absorbed so much light that anything outside of daytime outdoor and overly lit indoor shots would be too dark to view. Also, while Chronochrome was easily the best and most stable additive process, it still didn't quite alleviate the color tearing that would occur with fast motion. But the number one problem was the 100% proprietary equipment. Chronochrome film was completely incompatible with regular cameras and projectors. In spite of all this, Chronochrome was, in the short term, fairly successful, with regular showings at the Gaumont Palace in Paris and periodic showings in London and New York. I can't find anything concrete, but it appears that Chronochrome was over and out by the end of the decade. By now, especially if you've watched Archive long enough, you've probably seen some experimental color footage from Kodak from 1922. This is Kodachrome, but not that Kodachrome, which was introduced in 1935. This Kodachrome was created in 1913 by Eastman Kodak engineer John Capstaff. The original Kodachrome marks the first significant stab at subtractive color. At its most basic, on the filming end of things, 
the original Kodachrome adheres to the conventions of other two-color additive processes of the time. Yes, you heard me right. Just swap out the red and green filters for blue-green and red-orange filters. However, on the development end of things, it was a much more complicated system of bleaches, dyes, and ultimately two layers of film adhered together. It took until 1922 for this to be tested on motion pictures, and while the results looked quite nice and could be played on any 35mm projector, the lighting demands, both in shooting and playback, were too great to be practical. Kodak made its entry into the world of amateur filmmaking in 1928 with the introduction of their Kodacolor stock. Kodacolor was 16mm reversal stock. Read, once processed, it could be projected. No new prints were necessary. Using panchromatic film, read, sensitive to red, green, and blue, Color information was captured via microscopic lenses, or lenticules, on the film itself. This information could only be decoded by a special proprietary RGB filter. As such, on first glance, Kodacolor appears to be normal old black and white 16mm film. As for the processing, it could only be done by Kodak and had to be mailed in. Given its high price, proprietary nature, inability to be reproduced, lower than usual resolution, and massive lighting needs, Kodacolor quietly disappeared around 1932. To quickly finish up the Kodachrome story, in 1935, Kodak introduced a 16mm and later 8mm, Super 8 and 35mm film stock that could capture full color on any movie camera. This was Kodachrome, the famous one. Kodachrome is what's known as tripack film as in film with three layers of color emulsion to capture all the color data in one shot on one film. The film is processed through a lengthy series of developer chemicals, washes, re-exposures, and so on and so on. While it was mostly relegated to amateur use, Kodachrome managed an especially long life even outliving Technicolor, its final use being in 2002. The last variation of Type A Kodachrome 16mm movie film was discontinued in 2006, and the last variation of the 35mm still film was discontinued in 2009. There are actually a bunch more of these early experimental color processes. Today's episode only rounded up the biggest and or weirdest ones. So, with that in mind, just like at the end of the Silent Era Talking Pictures episode, if you want to fill in the gaps, please, at the very least, check out the two-part Discovering Cinema documentary which I think is out of print now, but uh, as of my making this, it's still available for streaming via Amazon Prime and at least a couple other services. And uh, of course, if you really want to dig deep, you can't beat a good old-fashioned book. And uh, not to mention, there's just too much to get into for a single archive episode. But uh, anyway, that's it for today's archive. Join me next time when I have the sudden realization that most of you 
probably couldn't care less about this film junk, and I better get my butt back into videotape territory.